Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, last Monday, as you know, was Halloween, or Halloween, which is a contraction for All Hallows Evening, and Hallows meaning holy ones. Confused already? That's my goal. No, <laughs> not to confuse you. Well, All Hallows Eve begins All Saints Day, like Christmas Eve begins Christmas Day, because in the Bible, you know, sundown is when the day begins. That's how the Jews used to understand it. So, since last Sunday we celebrated Reformation, this Sunday we're celebrating All Saints Day. In the first three centuries after Christ's resurrection, so after, within the first 300 years or so after Christ's resurrection, there were a lot of Christians who were killed, martyred for their faith. These martyrs were remembered at the time, back in those times, on the very day that they were killed, and often in the very spot that they were killed. Well, it got to be the point where there were so many martyrs, you see it was illegal, it was illegal to be a Christian, and they would say, you gotta say Caesar is Lord, and if you didn't say Caesar is Lord, often it would be off with your head. So that's why nobody, they talked about nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, because they would, the Christians, they would come up to the Christians and say, say Caesar is Lord. And they would have to say, Jesus is Lord. And they knew that if they said that, a very good chance would be that they would be killed for their faith instead of saying Caesar is Lord. Well, there came, became so many martyrs that basically it seemed like every single day of the calendar year they were celebrating or observing the death of one of the Christians, their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, who had been martyred for their faith. And it got to be like they were observing someone almost every day of the year. So instead, already by the second century, wow, already by the second century, the church designated one day as All Saints Day, All Saints Day. Well, you might be thinking, okay, why should we care? Why do we have to do this? Why should we remember or observe those who've gone before us in the faith? Well, there are a few reasons, maybe many reasons, but one of them is because, guess what? They are saints, we are saints. Also, we have that in common with each other. You might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Isn't there a denomination out there who says that saints are really just, there are just a few people that are called saints? And uh, yeah, one denomination does say that, that these are the people who did miracles while they were living or supposedly they have so many good works while they were living that they have so many good works that if you pray to them supposedly, that then you supposedly can get some of their leftover good works in order to earn heaven supposedly. Well, that's not how the meaning of the word saint is used in the Bible. In the Bible, the word means holy one, and a person is a saint when he or she's declared to be holy, when she is, he or she's called holy, when she or he trusts in Jesus Christ, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and that's how we become holy. We get the holiness of Jesus given to us as a gift simply by trusting in that what he did in his life in his death and resurrection. We're declared holy because of Jesus. We, are, we get his holiness. So we're called to be saints. We are called saints. Well, there's something else that we're called. And John tells us what else that something else is. We are called, the next, next slide there, I think, we are called children of God. And I love how he says, and so we are almost like an emphatic thing. We're called children of God, and so we are. Really, really, he's kind of saying, you are. We are really children of God. He doesn't want us to think this is some just symbolic name that sounds cute or nice or comforting. We really are children of God. We are fathered by him in our baptism. We've been born again. We are baptized into Christ Jesus through our baptism. We are adopted into his family. And since God is our Father, and we are His children, that means we, we, are family. Now, I don't know exactly how your family works, but I suppose, if your family's like mine or like most families, we have these things in common. We have rights and privileges in the family, we have duties and responsibilities in the family, and also, we learn from each other. For instance, in my family, in our family, we, our children have the rights and privileges 
of being loved by their parents in many different ways. We feed them, we clothe them, we shelter them. In our family, they have the rights and privileges of having a Lutheran school education. They have music lessons in our family. That's just a right and privilege of being in Stacy and Neil Wheeler's family. They have the right and privilege of having a college education as much as we can afford, depending on what college they go to, right? And, and they have the rights and privileges of family gatherings and vacations. May not they be the most glamorous vacations in the world, but they're invited to be there along with us. In addition, our children are listed in our will. That means they are heirs of our vast fortune, which I hope they're not expecting much. But still, whatever little that we have when we die, they will be able to complain over or divvy out over or maybe be happy over, whatever. But they're in our will because that's a right and privilege of being in our family. Well, the same goes for the family of God. We each have rights and privileges of being in the family of God. We have duties and responsibilities, and we also learn from each other. Let me explain. As a child of God, you have the right and privilege of his inheritance. Let's go to this next slide, which shows just next one more click there, I think. There you are. You are no longer a slave, but you are a son. Even if you're female, in the Bible, when Paul's talking to males and females, he's basically saying, you're all sons of God. And why did he say that? He wasn't being sexist. He was trying to show you your status because back in that culture, only the sons got the inheritance. I know that was wrong, that was bad, but that was their culture back then. So Paul's saying, whether you are fem female or male, you are a son of God. You have the right and privilege of the inheritance that God has planned for you. It's a beautiful thing. What are some of the other rights and privileges of being in the family of God? Well, here's some. You've received the Holy Spirit to guide you, dwelling inside of you. Here's another one. He promises to be with you as any faithful parent promises to be with his or her child. God promises to listen to you and to answer your prayers. And since you are his heir, you also will be glorified with Jesus. That means on the last day, you will rise from your grave, you will be given a glorified body, and you will live forever with him in the new heaven and the new earth. Now that is an inheritance. Mari, Rachel, and Olivia may not get a lot of material blessings from us when we die in our will, but they, you, we, all who trust in Jesus Christ will get this inheritance. We will be glorified with Jesus. We'll come out of that grave given a glorified body, and we will hear from Jesus himself saying, come, you who are blessed by my Father, come receive the inheritance that has been prepared for you since the foundation of the earth. Now that is a right and the privilege of being a child of God. That's beautiful, isn't it? Well, along with the rights and privileges of being a child of God, we also have duties and responsibilities. We are called to live purified lives. Now, you and I were purified in our baptisms, and God wants us, he calls us to live pure lives day to day now. We're no longer to look like the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? And just as the world views Jesus, the world is supposed to view us in a very similar way. We are having to, we're supposed to have the family resemblance of the family of God. We put away the sins of the world. There are very many, but here are a few. We put away the sins of the world like sex outside of marriage, like pornography, like gluttony, like greed, like gossip, like envy, so many different sins. We put them away. We might struggle with them. But we don't allow ourselves to live in them and just say, eh, what are you going to do? No, we turn from them, we confess them, we repent from them and seek to live different from those sins. We live out our vocations, whatever God has given us to do in our lives, in a way that's pleasing to him and what serves our neighbor. And finally, just as children and families learn from each other, our family, we learn from each other those experiences we have, so does the family of God. We learn from each other. We learn from those saints who've gone before us, like those like Paul and Peter and John who wrote our New Testament reading today, and from other church martyrs and early church fathers, and from Martin Luther, also from those who maybe more recent ones that were speakers and writers in our denomination, like Walter A. Meyer, the Lutheran Hour, and Oswald Hoffman from the Lutheran Hour. And then as they follow Jesus Christ, we also learn from our grandparents 
and our great-grandparents and our great-great-grandparents. Maybe they wrote journals and you learn from them or maybe the stories that have been passed down from your grandparents and your great-grandparents to you. We learn from them too as saints who've gone before. Every family gathering that my mom's side of the family has, they get out my grandmother's journal. My grandmother's now with Jesus. And they get out her journal because every night before she went to bed, she'd write just a little bit in a journal what she was thankful for, some of the things that she and granddad were struggling with. She got very honest. She very got, very got authentic and very transparent. And my mom and one of her sisters will take out her journal and read it at Christmas time or Easter or Thanksgiving. And they say, let's read a, just a portion of, of Ruth, her mom, our grandma, great-grandma, and what she wrote. And it talks about how God was with them through the tough times, and they went through some really tough times, and in the good times. And it was a way for them to hear how God was faithful to them, even through it all. So we learn from the saints who've gone before us, but we also, guess what? We learn from saints who are still with us today. Let me give you some examples. We learn from Millie Golightly, who she teaches us the importance of gathered worship she can't get herself here every Sunday morning, so she relies on other people here to get here to receive the gifts that God has for her, word and sacrament. So we learn from Millie on the importance of gathered worship here. She could just say, ah, uh, it's too much trouble. I don't want to bother anybody. But no, she says, worship is where God gives me his gifts. I want to be there. We learn from her. We learn from Fred Sorge, who gets here every Sunday morning at 7 o'clock to unlock the doors, turn on the lights, and make coffee for us. He didn't want anybody to know that. Of course, he, we do now. He didn't do it for anybody's thanks or praise. He does it in service to the Lord and to service to you and me. We learn patient leadership from Steve Althaus and James Tejan, our congregational president and held elder, and many other leaders, too. We learn the art of construction from Mike May and Kyle Brosh, and many other people too. We learn patience in illness from our, pe from our brothers and sisters like Dennis Bauer and Dennis Anderson and J.J. Kleinbeck and Jerry Hurdle and many others. We learn ways to worship God musically through Tom Salestine and Julie Wilsusan and Emily Berry. We learn w ways to worship God artistically, visually from Patty Hurdle. We learn to see that, you know what, we can even have full body worship when we look at Brooke Oliver dance before the Lord and say we can also, we can raise our hands and worship, we can clap, we can worship in full body. We learn the beauty of big families from the Lord, from Mary Buss and from Doris Moss. We learn from our foster and adoptive families that DNA alone does not define family. We learn dedication to God from our members who are faithful but whose spouses are not. We learn of hope in the midst of disease from our cancer survivor members. We learn of willingness to protect our freedoms and to protect our fellow citizens from our members who are first responders and our military veterans. Many more should be named here. We learn so many things from each, of a, from each other, those named here and those who are not named here. So yes, as the children of God, as the family of God, yeah, we learn from each other. We've got duties and responsibilities, but best of all, we have the rights and privileges, the inheritance that God gives us as a child of God. So I ask you, who are you really? Who is your, who, what is your identity at your core? Strip away all the other things in your life all the other relationships, all the other titles that you may hold, hold at your core, you are a child of God. Really? And so you are. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have made us your children through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the inheritance that is waiting for us. And we ask you, Lord, to help us to live the rest of our lives in as, our, as our true identity, as your children. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.